Hello, my name is Steve Miller. I'm the technical marketing manager for the physical modeling tools at the MathWorks. There's a lot that we're going to cover in the next hour, and so I wanted to give you a summary of the key points that I would like to make sure you take away from this presentation. First, we're going to see how modeling the entire system at the system level enables engineers to produce optimized designs. Wind turbines contain a lot of different types of subsystems, mechanical, hydraulic, controls, aerodynamics, and so on. Typical development processes have these developed separately, and then they finally come together in the hardware. We're going to see how we can analyze this entire system at the system level. The next point is that the ability to easily adjust the level of model fidelity will enable efficient development. At the start of the development process, you're going to see how we have a simple system, where we have idealized actuators, and some of the systems in the wind turbine, we're going to ignore them at the beginning. The purpose of that is so that we can iterate more quickly. The simulations run faster, and we're able to focus on problems within these different subsystems. As we develop the wind turbine, we're going to substitute in more realistic designs and then bring in the other systems so we can do the system level analysis. The ability to change the level of model fidelity is critical if you want to develop efficiently. And finally, at the end, we're going to see that more efficient and cost-effective testing can be achieved by generating standalone executables. We're going to show you the entire model, and at the, towards the end of the presentation, we're going to show how we can take that model and convert it into a standalone executable. This standalone executable can be used to run different types of tests. It requires fewer licenses and allows you to test more efficiently. Here's the agenda for our presentation. First, I'm going to show you an overview of the model so that you can see the systems that we're going to look at. We'll then cover pitch actuation and control, including the mechanical and the hydraulic systems. We'll then go through the yaw actuation system, showing mechanical systems, uh, the, the gear train and the electrical uh, actuator that we use to actuate the yaw system. We'll then cover power generation, where we connect in the gear train and the generator. We'll then cover wind loads, so how we model the effects of the wind on the turbine, the forces on the blades, and so on. We'll then cover the supervisory control system, and then look at how we can generate C code for doing tests. I'll now switch over to the model so that you can see what it looks like. So here's the model that we'll be working with. On the right-hand side is where we have the model of the wind turbine itself. We have the blades uh, for the mechanical system. In the nacelle are most of the subsystems we'll be talking about, including the pitch system, the gear train, the generator, and the yaw system. If I go back up to the top level, you'll see the tower and the connection to the grid, and that's the wind turbine. On the, at the top, you'll see where we have the model of the aerodynamic loads. The control systems we have here in the center, the pitch controller, the yaw controller, and then the main controller for the supervisory logic. And here is where we have our test inputs coming in, uh, the wind speed and direction. We have a number of plots that we'll be looking at in order to monitor how the simulation is running. And we have a 3D animation that we will use just to see how the, sim the wind turbine is spinning. So I'm going to run the simulation, and we'll do just a standard test. In the beginning of the simulation, you can see in the wind speed plot that the wind speed is slow, so the wind, the wind turbine is in park. It is not rotating. Here we have the wind turbine speed. When the wind speed gets above a certain level, the supervisory controller will turn the turbine on, so to speak, take it out of park, and pitch the blades so that the, that the blades generate lift and will start spinning the wind turbine. You can see that the wind turbine is accelerating. The pitch, angle, uh, the pitch angle of the blades is adjusting in order to get the wind turbine to spin at a constant speed, that constant speed being close to 15 revolutions per minute. So now the wind turbine is in normal operation. As the wind speed and direction are changing, we can see that the, blades, uh, the pitch of the blades is adjusting and that the yaw angle of the nacelle is adjusting again to keep the wind turbine spinning at a constant speed. Towards the end of our test, we'll see that the wind speed is dropping. Once the wind speed drops below a certain level, the supervisory control will decide that it does not make sense for the wind turbine to continue running. It will furl the blades, which you can see in the animation. We have the trailing edge of the blades is now pointing into the wind, and it brings the turbine to a stop. So this is one test that we have run using this, this system. We'll now go through this, this model to show you how we developed it and how the different systems work with one another. So the first system that we'll look at is the pitch actuation and control system. We'll look at the mechanical system and the hydraulic system that we use to actuate the blades. 
So to model the blade pitch linkage, we're going to create a model that looks like this. We have the blade, which can rotate about an axis. To rotate the blade about that axis, we have a mechanical linkage that can extend and contract. To model this mechanical system within the Simulink environment, we're going to use Sim Mechanics. When we're finished, this is what the model will look like. You'll see the different parts and the blocks representing the joints or the degrees of freedom. And we'll see that in the simulation, the, the linkage can extend and contract in order to rotate the blade. I'll now switch over to this model so that you can see what it looks like. So I'm going to open the blade pitch linkage model, and here you can see the mechanical system. If I run the simulation, you'll see, again, the 3D animation that is produced automatically by Sim Mechanics. And if we run the simulation, we'll see that the blade go, uh, rotates back and forth. If I look at the model, I can see the different blocks that we have used to build up the system. This system was modeled using Sim Mechanics, which is a multi-body simulation package. We have blocks that represent the rigid bodies, so these two for the mechanical linkage and this one for the blade. If I double-click on one of these blocks, you can see the different parameters that we can specify. As you would expect for a rigid body, you can specify mass, inertia, and the coordinate systems, or the points that we use to connect the parts together. These blocks represent the joints or the degrees of freedom. So if I double click on this block, I can see that I have here represented a translational degree of freedom or a prismatic joint. For those of you who have used Simulink before, you'll notice something different about this model. These blocks are connected with lines that are not arrows. These are physical connections. What, you've built, what we have built here is we've described the system using Sim Mechanics, the rigid bodies, the joints, and so on, and then Sim Mechanics figures out the equations of motion and runs the simulation. This is different than in normal Simulink where you would have to derive the equations of motion and then program it. With the animation, if I see that one of my parts is too long or too short and I want to know where it is in the model, I can simply click on it and it will highlight the block of interest. This helps us to debug the model so that we can see uh, w which portion of the model I need to, to fix. I won't build up the entire model, but I will show you how we can build up this, uh, at least a portion of this system. Sim mechanics you'll find in the Simulink library browser underneath Simscape. I'll open up a new model and go into the Sim mechanics block library. The first thing that we'll need is a body. So these will be the, this is the, uh, one of the bodies we'll use for the linkage. Here I would, I would drag the block into the model, specify the mass and the inertia, which you could get from a CAD system if you have it. The next block that I would need is a joint block to specify a degree of freedom. So this is how I would specify a prismatic joint that's used in the mechanical linkage that can extend and contract. And then I could simply copy this block and connect it here. So this is how I would build up my mechanical model. I look at the structure of the model and then use the blocks within Sim Mechanics to build a model that reflects that structure. I'm going to close this model. And so we have seen how we can build up this system. This was driven using uh, a Simulink signal. So you'll see in later models that we look at that we will sometimes drive this with, uh, with Simulink signals. And then we'll show you how we can connect it to an actuation system. So the next step is to design the pitch actuator. We have a set of pitch actuation requirements that we may have received from another department, but now we're going to start building up that system within the Simulink environment and use the simulation to determine more accurate requirements for the actuator. So we've just looked at the mechanical li linkage for the pitch system. Our pitch controller need, will, have, will decide what the pitch command is. What angle should we pitch the blades to generate the proper amount of lift to rotate the rotor? The actuator controller will need to uh, know what the current extension of the cylinder is. And using those two commands, it can figure out how much force needs to be applied to the actuator, the act how much force the actuator needs to apply to the linkage. We're going to, the, the problem that we often have is that we may have a set of requirements for our system that describes a bit about what the actuator needs to do, but it may not have enough detail for us to select or design an actuator. So what we're going to do is we're going to use simulation to determine more detailed requirements for the actuator. We're going to do this using an ideal actuator modeled in Simulink. We'll see that we'll run the simulation. We'll see that the system gives acceptable performance. And once we know that the system achieves acceptable for performance, we'll see how much force the actuator need to, needed to apply and how fast. And using this information, we can size the actuator either to 
uh, design it ourselves or to purchase it from a manufacturer. So I'll open up the model that shows this. So here we have the next phase of developing this wind turbine. Here's the blade linkage system that we saw a minute ago, where we have the, the bodies and the joints defining the blade, uh, the, the linkage system. And here's our connection to the actuator. So we are actuating this joint in the mechanical system. Here we have an ideal actuator. This ideal actuator can produce as much force as we want, as fast as we want it, and we're going to use that to figure out how much force does the actuator need to provide to give acceptable performance. And here we have the first revision of the actuator controller. Again, it takes in the command and then the data from the, how the extension of the cylinder to determine the force that the actuator must provide. So I'll run the simulation for a simple test where we simply pitch the blade in one direction, bring it back to center, pitch it in the other direction, and then bring it, bring it back to center. We can see in the simulation that these are the results. So the pink line is the command that we had. The yellow line are, is the results of the simulation, the pitch angle. And then on this plot, we can see the force that the actuator had to provide. And with this information, we now know, OK, if I'm designing for a blade of this size or weight and inertia, this is how much force our actuator has to provide. And here, this is how fast it needs to provide it to achieve this performance. This more detailed requirement will help make sure that we choose the proper actuator, that we don't oversize it by too much or undersize it. So now that we have these more detailed requirements for our actuator, we'll now move on to designing the actual actuation system. In this particular model, we have designed a hydraulic actuation system. So our hydraulic actuator looks like this. The control signal that we get from the controller in, in, is going to control the displacement of a hydraulic valve. The hydraulic valve controls the flow of hydraulic fluid into and out of a hydraulic cylinder. This hydraulic cylinder is then the linkage that rotates the blade. Now, an important aspect of this hydraulic system that we did not see in the simpler model is that this system needs to handle the case where there is a power failure. In the event of a power failure, the pitch control system or the pitch actuation system must rotate the blades to an angle so that it will bring the wind turbine to a stop. If this is not there and we have a power failure, if the blades stay at a fixed angle, the wind turbine could spin faster and faster until it destroys itself. So what we're going to show you in this hydraulic actuation design is that we have a spring-loaded accumulator that will become that will be connected to the system in the event of a power failure these two valves will open in the event of a power failure and this will rotate the blade to a position to pr to, to bring the wind turbine to a stop this is a protection system so we're going to design our hydraulic actuation system that includes this power failure condition using sim hydraulics and you'll see in the model that i show you the components that i've mentioned the spring loaded accumulator the valve and the hydraulic cylinder. When we're finished, we'll run the simulation and see that if the system follows the valve commands and in the event of a power failure, rotates the blade to a position that will bring the wind turbine to a stop. I'll now switch over to this model so that you can see what this looks like. So here's the model that we'll be looking at. Again, we still have the same mechanical pitch linkage where we are actuating uh, this mechanical linkage to rotate the blade. This is now connected to uh, a sim hydraulics model of a hydraulic actuation system. If I go into this model, you'll see the components as I have described in the system, where we have a proportional valve that controls the flow of hydraulic fluid into and out of this hydraulic cylinder. Here's the spring-loaded accumulator, which, uh, is, which will be connected to the system in the event of a power failure. And this is where we connect it to the mechanical system. If I run the simulation, you'll see the performance that I've explained where we have the valve command that it will follow and then in the event of a power failure it will rotate it into the position that will bring the wind turbine to a stop. We can look at the performance of the system to see uh, to measure different values and see how the system performed and if I show you the signal builder this is where we got our inputs again this is the command to the valve that we saw and this is the power to the system. We brought in the failure at about six seconds and saw that the system responded accordingly. Now, this, the, the physical network that you see here was modeled using sim hydraulics. And again, for those of you who use, have used Simulink, this is a different method of building up the system. The lines in this 
in this model represent ideal hydraulic connections. So we are, again, we're not feeding values from one block to the next. We're looking at our hydraulic system and building up a hydraulic schematic that reflects that, uh, building up a hydraulic system that reflects that schematic. To see how SimHydraulics works, I'll open, open up the Simulink library, or Simulink browser, and you can see that SimHydraulics is, uh, you'll find in the Simulink library browser. And it works similarly to Sim Mechanics. If I want to build up a hydraulic system, I can look at the Sim Hydraulics library. Here are the components that are available to me. So, for example, for the spring loaded accumulator that I used, I could simply drag that into my model and, hi and have that here. If I go into the valves library, there are a number of different kinds of valves. In the case of the valve that we had connected for the power failure, it was a simply a two way directional valve. So I can connect those hydraulic uh, those connections there. Similarly, for hydraulic actuation systems, I used a double acting hydraulic cylinder, so I can bring that into my system and connect that here. And again, this represents an ideal hydraulic connection. The hydraulic act the double acting hydraulic cylinder also has two mechanical connections: one for the housing and one for the uh, piston that can move. So there are components of Simscape that we can use in order to define the mechanical portions of the system. So I could go into translational elements, get a transla translational reference, which is simply a, a, a ground block, something a point in space that doesn't move, and connect that here. So you can see by looking at this, we can, we can build up a model that represents the, the hydraulic, the hydromechanical system. It looks like the schematic, so it's easier for us to compare to the actual system. It's easier for us to modify the system. I can remove valves. I can add orifices, uh, other hydraulic restrictions. And I can use this to communicate with other engineers. If I had this model built up using equations and I wanted to get help from a hydraulics engineer, he would have to first look at my equations and see that I've implemented them correctly. Here, he can take a look at the model and see exactly what the system looks like. So that's a brief introduction to sim hydraulics. If you want more information about which blocks are included in Sim Hydraulics or what they what these blocks capture, the documentation is available online and you can simply look there to see what we have captured and what we have not. So I'll go back to our presentation. Uh, so we've what we've done to this point is we have determined requirements for our hydraulic actuator and we have seen the design of the hydraulic actuator. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to include these in the overall model. So in our overall model, if I go down to this level, you can see here's where we have our pitch system. And if I go into this subsystem, you'll see the mechanical blocks as we have been talked about, talking about. This is the mechanical linkage. And here at this level, here's where we have the ideal actuators that we have seen in the model we looked at before. So what I can do is I can bring in these ideal actuators, run a test, and make sure that everything is fine. Then I can adjust the system and bring in the hydraulic actuation system that we've been looking at. Using configurable subsystems, <coughs> I've substituted in the hydraulic system. Now if I go into this model, the mechanical system is the same, but the actuation system is now the hydraulic system that we've been looking at, again, with the hydraulic cylinder, the accumulator, the valve, and so on. What I'm going to do to show you the difference between these two is I've set up a script that will run these two on the full wind turbine model. I'm going to turn the visualization off, and then I'm going to compare these pitch actuators using the, the full wind turbine model. So if I go down one level, you'll see we're running the system now with the ideal actuator. Now we've substituted in the hydraulic actuation system, and we're rerunning the simulation. Again, same commands, and the purpose of this is we're trying to check and see what the difference is in the force that is provided and in the performance. So this simulation is now complete, and when it's finished, we'll see a plot that shows the difference between the two. So we can see the red line is the ideal actuator, the blue line is the hydraulic design that we've come up with, which is more accurate than the idealized design that we had. We can see that the performance is similar, but not identical. And we can see that the force that is provided is also not the same. So if I'm trying to design a control algorithm and I'm working with an idealized model, I'll get close. 
but it's important that I have more detailed models that I can work with to refine and tune my algorithm so that when I put it on the final, the, the final hardware, I can have more confidence that the system is going to work properly. You'll see this method as we go through the development of the wind turbine. We start simple, looking at ideal systems in order to determine more detailed requirements, then come up with the actual design and make sure that that will also work with our control algorithm. So that is the pitch actuation system. We looked at the mechanical system, and we also looked at the hydromechanical system that we used to actuate that system. The next step that we're going to look at is the yaw actuation system, where we will see how we used sim driveline to model the gear system and sim electronics to model the actuator. So to, un to help you understand how a yaw actuation system works, uh, I have a diagram that will show you how what it looks like. So if we are looking at the nacelle from the top, the nacelle sits atop, to yaw the nacelle, we want to rotate it about this axis. Again, we're looking at the nacelle from the top as if we're in the sky. The nacelle sits atop a tower. And then inside the nacelle, we have a gear. This is called the ring gear, and it's, atta it's, attached, uh, it's, attached, it's attached to the tower. It doesn't rotate. On the sides of the, of the ring gear, we have the yaw gears. These gears can rotate. So they rotate, pushing against this fixed ring gear, allowing the nacelle to rotate about this axis. So what we need to do is to design actuators that will drive these yaw gears to make sure that the, to, to rotate the nacelle to point it into the wind. We have a set of requirements for this system, but we want to use simulation to determine more detailed requirements. We're going to model this system using Simulink, and we're going to show how we can use an ideal actuator to determine those more detailed requirements. Our yaw, our yaw controller will determine a yaw command, and with that yaw command, we need to determine how much torque the yaw actuators need to provide, again, to turn these gears to rotate the nacelle. The controller will compare the yaw command to the nacelle yaw angle, and this will, uh, the controller will then determine a yaw rate command. Part of our requirements is that the nacelle is not allowed to rotate faster than 0.5 degrees per second. So we'll, in our control logic, we'll put a limit on that yaw rate command. We'll compare it to the actual yaw rate, and then that control loop will determine what the torque should be. We'll see when we run this simulation that with this yaw angle command, the pink line being the command, and this control structure, we'll see that the, the nacelle rotates no faster than 0.5 degrees per second, and this is the amount of torque that the yaw actuators need to provide. I'll now switch over to the model so that you can see how this will be done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the nacelle. I'm going to lock the pitch system so that we are only interested in the yaw system. I'm going to lock the pitch system so that the blades are not moving, so that as I design my yaw system, that I, any dynamics that I see are due to the yaw system that I'm designing. I'm now going to unlock the yaw system by substituting in an, an ideal actuator. So now if I go into this system, we'll see the yaw ring that I talked about on the, with the diagram. Here are the four yaw gears that act to rotate the nacelle. And here are the ideal actuators. So if I go into this system, we'll see that we have ideal yaw actuators modeled in Simulink. And these can produce, again, as much torque as we need as fast as we want it. And the purpose of this, again, is to determine more detailed requirements for our actuation system. So I could run this simulation and determine how much torque was required. You can see this is, uh, this is the signal that will measure that. Once I have done that with the, ideal actuation, with the ideal actuators, the next step would be to add more detail to the system. I know how much torque my actuator needs to provide. That will lead me to, to choose the gearbox that will be in the yaw actuator and the motor that will be in the yaw actuator. So for the next level of detail, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this ideal actuation system and substitute in an ideal motor. This ideal motor, we have now added the gearbox. You can see it on the, on the picture that I've drawn here. If I go into the system, this level is exactly the same. We still have the yaw gears uh, pushing against the ring gear. But if we go into this system, we'll see that we have not only do we have an ideal actuator, but we've added in the yaw gearbox. The nacelle is extremely heavy, and so the the purpose of this gearbox is to increase the torque that the motor can provide in order to rotate the nacelle. 
if I go into this gearbox, you'll see how we've used Sim Driveline to model this complex gear set. We have four planetary gears that are linked together, and this again increases the torque that the motor can provide. So I've added a little bit more detail to my system. I know how much torque the entire actuator needs to produce. I can use this model to size my gearbox and to choose the motor. Once I have the requirements for what a reasonable gearbox would be and uh, how much torque the motor can produce, then I would go to the next level and start working with different motors. So now I'm going to go to uh, add a servo motor to our system. You'll see that the picture has changed. If I go into this subsystem, again, this level is the same. We still have yaw gears pushing on the yaw ring. If I go into the servo motor, we still have the gearbox that we've been working with, but now we have added a servo motor to the system. This servo motor has been modeled using sim electronics, where we have a servo motor block. And this servo motor block, again, comes from sim electronics. Here we can specify a lookup table that has the rotational speeds with respect to the torque values that it can produce. And we can also specify damping, inertia, and so on. Uh, for We've connected this, again, to our mechanical system, the, the gearbox, which in turn is connected to the sim mechanics model that we saw in the very beginning. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, use a script to compare two of these so that you can see the extra detail, how this extra detail can help uh, engineers design these systems and how they can uh, design not only the mechanical system but the control system as well. So I've set up another script that is going to run this comparison. It's first now running with the ideal motor. And if I go into, uh, if I bring up a plot of the the yaw, the, the, um, the cell yaw, you can see how the system is moving. So that was the pink line is the command, and the yellow line is the, the yaw of the nacelle. The script has moved on to the next step. We are now running it with the servo motor that we have seen using sim electronics. At the conclusion of the simulation, much like we saw in the design of the pitch actuator, we'll see a plot comparing these two results. And you'll see that with this additional detail in the model, I can see more dynamics in the system, and it will make it more likely that the controller that I design, when put on the actual model, will work as I have specified. So the two simulations are done. We can see that the performance is nearly the same, but we can see that the two actuators, although the torque is similar, it's not exactly the same. And if I'm designing this type of system, I need to have that, I'm, I need to have that additional detail in order to design my controller properly. Both models are valuable. You can see that the one with less detail runs more quickly. So as a control designer, I would need that to do more iterations. And I may use the more detailed design in order to validate the control algorithm that I have developed. So that is the control design of the, that is the design of the yaw actuator. The, the next step that we're going to look at is power generation. So we've been looking at the, the pitch system, the yaw system. Now we're going to show you how we can bring in the, gear the, the gearbox that connects the rotor to the generator, the generator itself, and the connection to the grid. So this is the system that we'll be looking at. We have the gear train, which is connected to the rotor, and that is, uh, on, the, uh, on this end of it, is connected to the generator. The generator will, be only, conne will only be connected to the grid when the generator is spinning at, its, at or near its nominal speed. So the supervisory logic needs to look at the, the speed of the turbine and other conditions and determine when it is appropriate to connect the generator to the grid. This is a very simplified model of this connection. Again, we're trying to illustrate the development process and the things that you can build up inside this system. So we're going to model the gear train, the generator, and the electrical grid for the turbine using SIM driveline and SIM power systems. The model that we're going to look at will look like this. You'll see some of the electrical components that we are using to model this system. And you'll see in the test that we'll run that as the generator speed, once the generator speed reach, reaches near nominal speed, that will connect the generator to the grid. There'll be some dynamics associated with that. And then we'll see that the generator is producing the, the rated power. So now what I'll do is I'll open up that model, the model that we use to develop this portion of the system. So here we have the gearbox that connects, again, the rotor to the generator. 
And if I look inside, you'll see this we have modeled with SIM driveline, where we have the planetary gear, uh, a helical gear, and two uh, gear steps, again, to, to connect these two. The reason this gearbox is necessary is that the rotor is spinning much, much slower than the generator needs to spin. So one of the, the primary purposes of this gearbox is to connect this, the slowly rotating uh, rotor to uh, the, the very fast rotating generator. Another, por another purpose of this model, uh, or this portion of the model, is to determine the loading on the gear train system. So we have a torque sensor here so that we can see the torque that the gear train experiences. This will be important for sizing the gear train. We can use this to determine if there are vibrations or harmonics in the system that are being injected by uh, the, the nacelle being at the wrong angle or the switching in the generator system. So that is the gear train. If I go to the, this mechanical connection connects to the generator. And if I go into this model, you'll see that here's where we have the asynchronous machine that models the generator and it is connected to the mechanical system that we saw modeled in SimDriveLine. When the, the supervisory logic determines that the conditions are okay, then these two breakers will be switched, and then this will connect it to a transformer, which is connected to the rest of the grid. This is, a, again, a very simple model of this connection. There are more advanced algorithms and switching for this, and we have SimPower Systems models that show those more complex uh, configurations. So what I'll do now is I'll run the simulation so that you can see how this works. So the simulation is now complete. If you see on the right-hand side, this is the turbine speed. So it starts from a speed of zero and speeds up to a certain level. We can see that after the turbine reached the near nominal speed, we then connected the generator to the grid. You can see the dynamics associated with that. And then you can see um, also how those dynamics affected the gear train input torque. So again, part of the purpose of this model would be to predict the loading on the gearbox to make sure we've sized the components properly. This is something we can see here. So what I'll do now is I'll switch over to the main model and show you how we can connect that to the, to the full model. So now we are inside the nacelle. The pitch systems and, I, and yaw systems I have set back to ideal. We have now added the gear train. Which is, this is the model that we saw on, in the previous design. And here we have the generator. Again, this is the same system I showed you in the smaller model that we used to develop this electrical system. I'm going to run the model, and we'll see that, how this system behaves. It's going to take me a second here to find the generator blocks. So the generator is now not connected to the grid. So at this point, it is not producing power. Uh, this is the same set of inputs that we were testing before. We know that the wind speed will have to increase to a certain level before the rotor will start spinning. And then it, the generator will need to uh, reach uh, operating speed before it's connected to the grid. So you can see here the wind speed is increasing, the rotor speed is increasing, and once the rotor speed again reaches nominal speed, then the generator will be connected to the grid and we will start producing power. So now the, the generator has reached nominal speed. As we saw in the smaller model, there is a dynamic associated with this uh, hard, um, hard connection to the grid, a hard start, sorry. And then once these dynamics have settled out, the simulation will speed up again and we'll see that it is producing, that the system will now produce power. By incorporating all these systems into the overall design, we can use this to figure out how efficient the turbine is and how efficient the control systems are. There will be times when the generator needs to be shut off, and we'll see, we can measure how much power it is producing and how often. This is a way to improve the amount of power or kilowatts produced per, uh, per money invested in the system. So we, can now, we now see that the, dy the dynamics have uh, settled out, the wind turbine is spinning at its nominal speed, and we can see that the wind turbine is producing power. I'll stop the simulation now. As I mentioned, we have more detailed models that show uh, in more detail the connection between the generator and the grid that are available uh, as standard demonstrations within the product. I'll now switch back to the presentation. So we have covered 
the pitch actuation system, the yaw actuation system, and the power generation. The next step we'll look at is how we modeled the loading of the winds on the on the turbine. So the the wind turbine has, as we all know, a set of blades. Wind strikes those blades, producing lift, and then producing a moment that rotates that uh, rotates the rotor. What we need to incorporate in our model is the model of how the wind interacts with the blades to produce this moment. We're going to show you two methods of doing this, one using base Simulink and one using embedded MATLAB. We're going to show you two different models at different levels of fidelity. The first model that we're going to show you is a single element model. We're going to assume that the blade is simply one, uh, one element. We'll have one wind speed and direction, and from that we'll calculate a single value of lift and drag. This single element model is useful for quick and simple approximations. However, we know in reality that the interaction between the wind and the blade is more complex. Along the length of the blade, the wind speed will, and direction will vary. And so what we'll do for a more detailed model is we'll break up this blade into elements and we'll calculate the lift and drag on each element by calculating the wind speed and direction on each element. So that you understand why we need to do this, we need to look briefly at the calculation of lift and drag on a wind turbine blade. The force on the blade depends on wind speed and direction, which you might expect, but it's also important to incorporate the rotor speed. This is, the, this is how we do that calculation. Uh, the wind hitting the, this, the, the diagram you're looking at is a cross section of the blade. The wind strikes the blade, producing lift and drag and the lift and drag are calculated using these equations. These are simplified versions of these equations, but they are valid and often used in this industry. Now the lift and drag that are produced depends upon the lift and drag coefficients, which depend upon the angle of attack and a number of, of other elements. We're going to focus on the angle of attack. Now the angle of attack is the angle between the resultant wind and a, a cord from the leading edge to the trailing edge. And the angle of attack is dependent upon the inflow angle and the pitch angle. Now the pitch angle we know. This is the angle that we have rotated the blade to. And the inflow angle, well this is the, the, the angle between the, the wind and this line. So we have, and this is dependent upon pure wind or the, the wind uh, that is coming in and the uh, rotation wind. So the speed, the, the component of the wind that is due to the blade rotating. If we know the rotation speed and the speed and direction of the wind, we can calculate the inflow angle, which allows us to calculate the angle of attack and therefore the lift and the drag. We've modeled this in our model using Simulink, and I'll show you that in the overall model right now. So the lift and drag model that we have at this top level is the single element model. And we have modeled this using Simulink, and we've obtained lift and drag coefficients that are often used in this industry in a lookup table in order to calculate the lift, and, uh, the lift and drag coefficients for the simulation. And we've been running the simulation to this point using uh, this single element model. Now, as I mentioned, this is a simplification. We need to look at uh, how we need to look at a more complex model because of the variation of the wind speed along the length of the blade. So the second model that we're going to look at is the seg it uses a segmented blade approach. Um, because the blade is spinning, the wind speed will vary along the length of the blade. So the end of the blade will experience, uh, the, the wind due to rotation will be faster than uh, points closer to the center on the blade. And as we've seen, the rotational wind is a component of the resultant wind, so we need to take this into effect to accurately calculate the lift and drag. So to improve our model, we're going to break up the blade into segments and model it that way. So calculate the, wind, uh, calculate the lift and drag for each segment, sum that together to calculate the moment. And this calculation we have done using embedded MATLAB. I'll show you that in the model now. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this simple model that we were working with in the beginning because it ran quickly and was easy to understand, and I'm going to replace this with a more detailed model the segmented model that I have described. Now when I go into this block, you'll see an embedded MATLAB block. This block, if we double click on it, will open up MATLAB code that we can use for this type of modeling. And I won't go through the entire model, but I wanted to show you this, this, that this approach is available. So we can use a text-based model to, uh, to set up this calculation, where we have a loop for each of the blades, 
and then a loop for each of the segments. So I can control exactly how detailed this model is by increasing or decreasing the number of segments. And the best part about this is, is that it uses MATLAB. So if you are an engineer who has experience with MATLAB, you'll be able to use this to create this model. The, the, the term we are using for this is embedded MATLAB, and the reason we're using that term is because this uh, MATLAB code that we have written can be converted into C code to be put on your controller on, or on other hardware. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rerun the simulation. Uh, I'm going to rerun the simulation with this uh, segmented model. I'm going to remove the generator in order to enable the simulation to run a little bit faster. So we can see that with the simplified model, the simulation, uh, the rotor got up to nominal speed in just under 30 seconds. So I'm going to rerun the simulation with the segmented model. What we're going to see is that with this more detailed model, the simulation behaves a bit differently. Again, because we have more information in the model, it takes into effect, uh, as I explained, the variation of wind speed and direction along the length of the blade. It also takes into account things like induced velocity, which is a very common uh, topic uh, among uh, helicopters and uh, other rotating systems. So we can see that the simulation is running, and we can see that it's taking longer for the system to get up to operating speed. Again, with this more detailed model, I have more accurate behavior for my system. And this will, again, enable me to develop more efficient and more optimized controllers. So I'm going to stop the simulation now. I wanted to show you that we can uh, easily switch between these two levels of model fidelity and the effect that it might have on our system. So now we've seen most of the parts of the wind turbine where we have looked at the pitch system, the yaw system, the power generation, and the model of the aerodynamic loads. Now we'll look at the control system modeled in state flow. The sup uh, when we design a wind turbine, there is, in most cases, a supervisory logic controller that controls uh, the turning on and off of different systems. It's sometimes referred to as the protection system, and it will look at the different conditions of the turbine to determine whether it should be turned on or off in park or not in park. A very, very simplified specification of what that supervisory logic would look like could look like this. You would define states like a park state where the park brake is turned on, the pitch brake is turned off, and the generator is not connected to the grid. When the wind gets above a certain speed, we might move into the startup state where we release the parking brake and leave the other two systems in their previous state. Then when the turbine reaches minimum operating speed, we'll then connect the, grid to the, uh, connect the generator to the grid and the turbine will be in generating mode. And under a number of different conditions, we may need to stop the turbine, so we'll move into a brake mode where we are acting to slow the turbine down to bring it to a stop, and when it has reached uh, a slow enough speed will then put the turbine in park. There are a number of other states that could exist here. This is a simplified version just to illustrate the point of how we can specify this. So our challenge is to, is to create uh, a model that implements the specification. And in our model, we'll do that using state flow. The state flow model will look like this. You'll see it looks very similar to the specification that we were looking at. And you can see how we can specify the different states, what to do in that state, and how uh, and the conditions for transitioning from that state to another. I'll now switch over to the model so that you can see what this looks like. So here's the supervisory controller implemented in state flow. Uh, if I go into this block, you'll see the different states that we spoke about, the park state, the startup state, and so on. If I run the simulation, you'll see how during the simulation an animation that shows it transitioning from one state to the next. This is very helpful for debugging purposes as well. But the most important part is that we need to create a supervisory logic system. This is a very intuitive way to specify this type of system and to bring it into our overall simulation. I'll go back to the main model so that you can see where we incorporated that into the overall system. So here we have uh, the main controller. And underneath here, this is where we brought in the wind turbine uh, supervisory logic controller. You can see that we brought in the wind speed and the turbine speed, and here we set the, different, the states of different components of our system, the pitch system, the parking brake, the generator, and so on. So this is, a way, this is the, uh, the way we specified the supervisory logic in our system. There are a number of other controllers in this system. We will not cover that during this particular presentation, 
Um, but you can see we, we saw them in, implemented in Simulink in an earlier model. I'm going to take this moment to close a few of the models that I have open before we continue on to the, the last phase of our presentation. Okay. So, we've seen with how to specify the supervisory logic controller. The next thing that I want to show you is how we can generate C code from this entire model. There are a number of reasons why we would need to generate C code, for example, doing hardware in the loop tests or for putting C code on the embedded controller. I'm going to show you in this demonstration, I'm going to simply show you how we can generate C code to do a parameter sweep test. So we have our model of our wind turbine, and I have a number of tests that I need to run. Those tests may include varying different control or physical parameters, or I might want to run it with different test vectors, so wind test vectors, to test loading or to test other types of conditions. So what I'm going to do is instead of running the simulation that in the method we've seen so far, I'm going to run it in a more efficient way that requires less licenses, less time, and can be distributed to other machines. We're going to use real-time workshop to generate a standalone executable from this model. So the model that we've seen, we're going to generate a standalone executable from it. I'll then generate a set of parameter files, and using those, we'll run the simulation uh, in a standalone executable mode. I won't have time to run all four simulations, but you'll see that we, could, we can run these on separate machines that without, without all of the licenses that are normally required for simulation, and then evaluate the results later. Here are the steps that we'll need to go through to do this parameter sweep. First, we'll need to build the standalone executable. Next, we'll need to generate different parameter sets so that we can uh, feed them into the simulation. We'll then run the standalone simulation using this command, and then you'll see the results that we plot at the end. I'll now switch over to MATLAB in order to show you how this is done. So I've written a script that will take us through these steps. The first step is to build the standalone executable. Up here, you'll see the this is the directory. So you'll see once we've completed this step, uh, a, a wind turbine rsim.exe, and that will be the standalone executable that we will use to run this parameter sweep. You can see in the command window that we are producing the uh, standalone executable. So all of the elements that we have been discussing, the um, the embedded MATLAB for the aerodynamics, the SIM mechanics, the uh, state flow model are all being converted into C code so that we can produce the standalone executable. When these, when the standalone, when this process is finished, we'll have the file on this side, and that's what we'll use to run the parameter sweep that we've been discussing. Okay, so the process is complete. We can see that we now have windturbine.exe. That is our standalone executable. The next step, as I explained, was we need to generate we need to generate the the parameter files or the that will the 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 files that will have the values for the parameters in it. So I'll execute the next portion of this script, which will produce a file called windturbineparameters01.mat. So this parameter file is what we will use to control the simulation. If I, to do a parameter sweep, I would generate multiple of these and then uh, run them accordingly. The next step will run the standalone executable. So what, we've, what we're doing now is we're using the, this exclamation point command in order to execute this uh, at a DOS prompt. So we're now running the standalone executable in a DOS window and with the parameter values that we have that we have saved and put into this. We also have specified, we have also specified where we will save the results. So results underscore 01 dot MAT, that's where the results of the simulation will be saved. So if I were running this on separate machines, I could set up uh, a script that executes the standalone executable with different parameter values. The results will be saved as a dot mat file, and then I could load those at the end into my MATLAB session to post-process them. So the, the, the simulation is complete, and so now what I'll do is I'll run uh, the next step of the script, which will simply produce a plot. I chose to plot the amount of torque that the gear train is experiencing. So you can see these are the results that we got from the simulation. So the purpose of this was to show you that 
all of the things that we have, you've seen, we can generate C code from them, and that can be used for other purposes. In this case, we used it for a parameter sweep, but we could also use it, we could also put the embedded code directly on the PLC or controller that you have in your wind turbine. We could use it to do hardware in the loop tests and so on. The last thing that I want to show you is how you can automatically run these tests and get the results uh, and document the results. When we're developing wind turbines and other complicated systems, we often make a design change. We then have to run tests, evaluate the results of those tests, and that will lead to a new design change. In this process, there are two steps that are usually time consuming. One is the running of the tests, uh, one, the running of the tests, the looking at the results and evaluating of the results. We would like to speed this process up. So what I'm going to show you is how you can automatically run these tests and automatically document and evaluate the results. This will speed up the iteration process, allowing you to test more ideas more quickly and hopefully come up with a more optimized design. I'm going to show you how you can incorporate things like uh, screenshots of the plots, of simulation results, the model, and even test fail, uh, uh, test fail, um, pass or fail results into a document, a PDF, HTML, Word doc, and so on. And we'll see how we can do that automatically. So to show you what one of those reports look like, I'll open that here. So this is a, a report that was produced automatically using the Simulink report generator. And you'll see that we have different sections that have screenshots of the model, different simulation results. Um, and then at the bottom, I believe I have simulation time so I can keep uh, an eye on how well the simulation is performing. So to, to generate this report, I would need to use the Simulink report generator. You'll see here I've set up a template that has different chapters and it goes through two different, <coughs> two different tests, one using one set of wind test data and another using a, a different set of wind test data. So here we've got the, the wind turbine model um, using the wind input that we've been working with in the very beginning. And then as the simulation runs, we will see that it switches over and uses another set of wind test data that tests it at a higher speed. Um, I'm going to, th this, that's the process that we would go through in order to run, to, to produce this data. And here you can see, um, it, it, dur as it is producing the, this report, you'll see it click through the different steps of the report and in the end, it will produce the, the HTML file that we have been working with. We're running out of time, so I'm not going to make you sit here and watch this. I'm going to summarize so that we can get to your questions. So to summarize what we've talked about here, we've seen how we can model the entire system at the system level in order to enable engineers to produce optimized designs. We included all of these different subsystems into the overall system model in order to, to optimize the, the design of the wind turbine. We saw that we were able to adjust the level of model fidelity go using ideal actuators to iterate quickly and to determine detailed requirements and then substituting in more realistic designs to test the system. And finally, we saw that more efficient and cost-effective testing can be achieved by generating standalone executables.